Um, today I'm going to talk about something that, uh, you know, you probably, uh, it, it's kind of the elephant in the room, but it's oftentimes one that uh, we don't talk about a lot uh, in uh, business journalism circles, and that is really finding students uh, to take your programs. Um, the problem that uh, you find uh, is that uh, you often are like this scene out of the movie. Uh, you were expecting everyone to appear and come, and your program is an elective. Uh, your program has great professor. You have tons of work that you put into your syllabus. You have done everything you possibly can, and then you go to the uh, sign-in sheet and you find that you've got two students. And uh, the reason why is because a lot of students come to journalism school with other ideas about what they want to do. Uh, they come in and want to be great sports reporters, they want to be on television, uh, they want to do other kinds of things. They don't realize that business journalism is uh, one of the highest paid uh, areas that you can go into, that it's a lot of fun, that, uh, that it's uh, like sports in many ways because you keep score uh, and you're uh, out there uh, doing um, uh, great work and you can win a Pulitzer there just as easily as you can anywhere else or win an Emmy or something else. There's opportunities if you're in television, radio, and uh, print and digital. Uh, but a lot of students just don't, don't seem to get this. And so you, uh, one of the things that we have to do in, in what we're doing is we've got to be able to sell, get students interested in what we're doing. And so it requires a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, uh, that some other areas don't have to do. Uh, and oftentimes one of the reasons why is because your, your course might not be required. Uh, in my particular case, uh, we only have two required courses in the business journalism area and the rest are electives. And I don't know about your universities, but ours uh, requires you to have 12 students at the minimum in a class. So, you know, you've got to have 12 to 16, and soon I hear it may go to 16 to 18. So we've got, you know, we've got to make sure that we have a, a full class uh, to keep the, the, this going. So the first thing that I do, this is the student paper, the man eater, is uh, I read this and I look for the best reporters and I look for the best writers. Uh, and I make contact with them. It's easy to find their email addresses because those email addresses are right there. You just pull it up and uh, you can, at least we can there at the university, and send them a note saying it was a great story. And, Maybe, uh, and I'm, I'm watching, following, like to meet you. Um, but I think scouting out students in student media, even when they're freshmen, you have to start there and start developing them and showing them that you have an interest in them. Um, do you have a place where students can get published? At the School of Journalism uh, at Missouri, we did not. Uh, the Missourian, uh, which is our daily paper, didn't even have a business beat. Neither did KBIA, our uh, NPR radio affiliate. Neither did KOMU, our NBC TV affiliate. Um, nobody, was nobody was covering business. Um, so uh, if you're going to do business stories, part of it is getting them published in one, one format or another. And so at Missouri, we started, I started something called Missouri Business Alert. You can look it up, MissouriBusinessAlert.com, uh, where, uh, where, our, where our reporters get uh, their stories published and they get feedback. We have our own newsroom. We cover the entire state of Missouri. It's an entrepreneurial effort. I could go into it in some depth if you're interested. Uh, and we're about to become an LLC and be totally self-supporting. So um, it's uh, different than any of the other platforms because the other platforms we have on campus uh, are pretty much university supported. I figured if I was going to start something new, uh, being a business person, I'd have to pay for it. So I had to figure out a way to get that done. Um, happy to send you the business plan and all the other things that we did. I did this in concert with students from the, uh, the business school and the journalism school in this startup. Students like being part of startups. Um, we have a large strategic communication group, uh, uh, teaching area. I think 
close to 50% of our students are in this area, strategic communication. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't know business journalism. In fact, it means that they should. Uh, so I think one of the things you want to do when you're out promoting is not to leave this large group out of what you're, what you're doing because they need to understand the business, uh, not only the business side of what uh, uh, they're doing, but also the businesses of, that uh, they're going to be representing. And so business journalism is an excellent place for them to plant their feet and don't work, uh, ignore that group of students. Sometimes I find people who say, well, they're in STRATCOM, so they might not be interested uh, in us. <clears throat> Pizza, uh, <laughs> this works wonderful things. Um, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, but one of the things that I use it for is, uh, you know, just an informational session at the beginning of school, and I invite as many students as I can. It's sort of like inviting people to a party. So if you invite 10, expect five. Uh, but uh, free food does help add people to uh, who come and talk about your classes, talk about the other cool things that you're going to be doing, and the people you have been recruiting all along. Um, I also encourage you to be involved in student organizations and student groups. Um, you know, uh, that isn't a way in which to branch yourself out. Since the very beginning, I've been the advisor for the Asian uh, American Journalists Association group in the University of Missouri, but I also make frequent stops in at NABJ and other organizations uh, to tell them about what we're doing and tell them about why they should be paying attention to, to us. Um, take 15 minutes at the beginning of uh, each semester and go visit their meetings and they'll be happy to have you come and talk. Uh, they're always looking for speakers and you may pick up a few students. I always do. Um, from different organizations and God knows business journalism needs diversity and this is a great way in which to um, be uh, helping recruit uh, other other people of color. Um, this is a group I got involved with, didn't expect to, um, but I walked into the room after I was invited to be the faculty uh, spokesman, not faculty spokesman, but contact for this and there were like 300 students involved in this. And they were all sophomores, freshmen. Uh, this is a group that essentially does good work in Malawi. Um, uh, some students had gotten it uh, going. Uh, they needed a faculty advisor. Um, and I found that I could preach business <coughs> journalism in the, to these students. But there are lots of gr student groups like this on your campus. Find one that's of interest to you and uh, I have a particular interest in Africa, and so I'm able to not only talk about business journalism, but also help guide them through a lot of things. And um, you'll have some fun with them, fun too. I mean, you'll, you'll, these guys were doing a lot of kind of crazy things when I first came on board. I got an, account, an accountant uh, to, uh, from the accounting school to help make sure that our finances were in order, made sure that they notified the police for the next fun run and other things that they were doing. Uh, you know, they were kind of uh, not so great. Uh, this is Joan Gable. She was, she was the dean at the University uh, of Missouri School of Business, but now she's the provost at the uh, University of South Carolina. Um, and they don't yet have not selected a new dean there, but uh, Joan was uh, one of the first people that I reached out to when I got my chair. And she was quite welcoming, made me a courtesy appointment in the business school. And uh, she and I began, I taught some classes over there. And I ended up having students coming over from the business school to take journalism classes. And so this became a whole nother route for me in which to recruit students that I might not have uh, perhaps used. I've got 10 students now from my class coming up uh, this uh, spring from the business school. So um, it's, a, it's a great source of, of possibilities and a great source of expertise. I've got to know a lot of the professors over there and uh, they're really good at helping um, our students understand some of the things that uh, are really deep and specialized. Now from our standpoint, <coughs> we bring in speakers all the time and they love 
our journalism speakers. They love Tom Contigliano, who you may have seen here. Uh, they love uh, other people we bring in from Bloomberg. So their finance uh, classes and their clubs and things like that love to have our speakers. So it's another way in which to uh, get things going. And also sometimes uh, they get interested in journalism through the speakers, start taking your classes, and then all of a sudden you have business students who never thought about journalism getting involved in journalism. This is something that I do frequently as I get out and I talk to every class that I can. Uh, Apple likes this picture. It was taken at Missouri with all the <laughs> Apple computers. Uh, I think it helped us get a Microsoft lab uh, in our school. Um, but I find that uh, sometimes I'll be talking to classes that have um, 10, uh, you know, at all hours of the day, and there may be 10, there may be uh, 300 in the class. Um, I find I can pick up a couple of students from every time I talk, uh, and sometimes more. And what do I say during those talks? Um, I talk to them about, first thing I say is, how many of you would uh, like to work overseas? Usually I get a pretty large number of hands go up. How many of you would like to make a pretty good starting wage? Hands keep going up. Um, how many of you thought about business journalism? No hands go up. <laughs> so uh, there's my ent entree to them, to talk to them about how business journalism can take them into uh, the places that they want to go. And then I can talk about some student success stories. And um, I think that, that is, uh, that's probably a key thing in, in what you do there. You can always work in a student success story uh, about someone who uh, has taken your class or who is in, was in business journalism and is doing really well right now. Uh, it's good. Um, this is Jackie Banaszynski, one of our professors. Uh, some of you may know her. She's, uh, she's a frequent teacher outside of the school. She does really well on social media. I encourage you to be involved in social media. That's another way in which to get students. They pretty much live uh, on these things. Um, in fact, on campus, I slow down to about one mile per hour because I have students walking out in front of me all the time doing this. Uh, so I want you, ne you need to be on social media. You need to be on Twitter. You need to be on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that um, you can communicate with your students. That's how, they, that's how they communicate these days. I mean, one of the things I always do is ask students, you know, how did you get this morning's news? Was it the newspaper? No hands go up. Um, was it television? No hands go up. Was it radio? No hands go up. Well, then how did you get it? Twitter, usually. Most of them will tell me that they got Twitter, and then uh, we'll talk about the news based upon that, and what did they miss and what did they get. But these platforms that we often train upon, radio, television, the traditional ones, that's not how the students are getting their news. That's not how to communicate with them during their 24 hours each day. So you have got to be able to uh, communicate with them. Um, I teach uh, business journalism around the world. Um, this is a shot from, um, from Algiers. I was there last year um, talking to about 100 different business journalists. And one of the things that I, I like to tell students is, is that uh, the reason I got that job and was able to go over there for a couple of weeks and teach was because that they wanted to learn about business journalism. Um, in a lot of countries, China, uh, etc., uh, the, as they open the door a little bit, business journalism is usually one of the first things uh, that they open it up to. And um, this is a case in point here in Algiers, and um, it's uh, and 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 we have an ongoing project there. We brought academics. Uh, from Algeria to uh, the University of Missouri, and we're working on developing their business journalism education system there in, in that country. So there's funding possibilities that can happen for your school. Uh, but from a student perspective, the idea of going overseas, um, the way I got to do that is because of, because of business journalism. And I like to point that out. This is one of my classes there. Uh, the way that I teach classes, um, uh, 
very simply is I like to go and explain the macro and then, you know, what's the big story in agriculture, uh, what is, what's happening out there from a macro perspective and then a micro perspective and, and then how do you find that kind of stuff uh, out there uh, and where, is, where are these things uh, most likely to be found. There was a study that was just done in Germany where the German government, uh, not German government, they, they funded this, this study that uh, these academics went around and looked at what, how, how journalists were working as far as search tools go. And they found that something like 95% of Germ, uh, German journalists used um, Google. So that was their main way of finding any kind of information out. I don't think it's too hard to leap over here and see much the same thing. So one of the things in business journalism that I do when I'm teaching is show there's a whole lot more than Google out there. Almost every federal agency has a great website that can give you great local stories. Um, and you can confirm or deny uh, anecdotes that you hear out in the community oftentimes by just looking at some of those websites. So uh, that takes you down to the micro. I was telling a group last night that uh, one of our visitors from uh, New York, from Bloomberg, had gotten stuck at the airport in Columbia. We have a small little airport that goes to Chicago and goes to Dallas, these regional jets. So she had gotten out there at the 5 o'clock in the morning wake-up time and also takeoff time, and they were coming down the runway. They had to stop because a little thing called a temperature gauge had gone out at the Columbia regional airport and apparently you can't take off with one of the, without one of those things working and they didn't have a spare so they had to turn around to the gate unload everybody and then take them to St. Louis and it took and then they went to New York from there well what was interesting about that was you know she it was it was an anecdote so I said to my students is this an outlier or is this something that's a reality we were able to go on the um, FAA website and find out that actually 65% of the flights from Columbia to Chicago are delayed by an hour or more. Um, real simple thing. It was an interesting story at the time when Columbia was trying to build a larger airport. So there was that news to it as well. So um, a lot of this kind of stuff is, is out there and available and low-hanging fruit as I call it, but you just have to kind of know to go to look for it, and where to look for it. So by knowing the um, kind of the large story of what's going on, then getting down to the macro story, and then checking out theories. Are, are, is this an outlier story, or is this something that's new? I had a student um, from that class uh, uh, last year at the Charlotte Observer, and uh, he got curious about the people that bought the PTL club. And the as you may remember them, Jim, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and all of that crazy stuff that went on, and uh, how much money they were making. So we, we had done a 990 class, and he pulled down the 990s on these people and found out the new guy was making $5 million a year. And then the wife was making a million and the kids were making a million. And the Charlotte Observer Business, School, business uh, Desk told me this was the best story that had been broken all summer. But that had been sitting there for years in the 1990s. And all it did was take somebody who had a little curiosity to just check it out. Um, I, won't, I won't get into this uh, uh, and show this, but... This is, I take students to South Africa every year as part one of the things that I do. I concocted a business tr uh, journalism trip down there where we uh, go and interview people uh, who fought apartheid and are now in top business uh, in uh, South Africa and doing remarkable things. And we go and work in the uh, archives at the, at the Mayabuya archives, which means coming home, uh, at the University of Western Cape, and then we go out and interview <coughs> these people in the flesh. Anyway, I have a film I can share with you that shows you what we do there. I, I've got kind of stretched here a little bit for time. 
This is Mike Jenner, who's one of my friends and also a, uh, uh, a, a great professor. Um, one of the things that he does, and I think has been really great, is he started a data journalism class, and he partners with a former Missouri grad, um, well, a Missouri grad who is, uh, who is currently the, one of the chief people at the New York Times who does data journalism. So they get his instruction, and then they get the New York Times, what they're doing, and so you're getting cutting edge things going on. So use your contacts, and if you can, make them part of your class. It makes the class much more exciting, much more fun, um, and much more up to date. If you can, uh, and a student is worthy of it, nominate them for things. Uh, this student was uh, one, one of the top academic awards at the university for the entire university. Her name is Natalie Chang. Uh, and uh, this is her and I together at graduation. Uh, and I was, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you do this for students and then the word spreads. And then other good students are interested in what you're doing. Uh, so it's, it's about her, obviously, but it's also about the classes that we're teaching, too, and trying to spread the words of that. Here, uh, celebration. Uh, this fellow, Jim, uh, Michael Stacy, um, is uh, one of our students. Uh, we celebrated his birthday when we were in South Africa. He has a journalism background, and he is getting his MBA here. So look for ways to celebrate your good students when you can. Another thing is special events. Plan them as much as you possibly can. Uh, always try to, you know, add a couple of people in every year. This is a group from the Friendly Group who were here uh, meeting with Marvin Kalb um, and talking with him. Um, it was a fascinating thing. Marvin is, I think, in his mid-80s and he is sharp as ever. Uh, he's just an amazing guy. He, uh, started uh, the Shorenstein program at Harvard. Business Journalism Club. This is something that uh, is a very good thing to do. Uh, I encourage you uh, to do it. What do, I, I, what do we do there? Um, I make sure that our students got, get the access to the very top guests that we have coming in. They get to meet them. We have dinners with them. Uh, we have round tables with them. Uh, this to me is uh, a special sort of thing that they get to do. Um, uh, we teach skills, social media, uh, and we meet once a month. And this is something that can be very helpful to rounding up people and spreading the word about what you're doing. And ask them for ideas. Have them elect their presidents and their vice presidents. Have them uh, set this kind of thing up, and I think you'll find it quite helpful. This is Tom, great guest to have in. Um, he's good because the business school loves him as much as the journalism school because he explains financials and can go deeper than anybody that I know in, uh, on the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, but you know, they also have lots of other people there. Uh, Steve Stroth, who, who focuses on commodities out of Chicago, is fantastic. Um, uh, Cheska Antonelli, who's uh, one of their bright young stars, she's in her mid-30s, was an art history major, and I'm just amazed how she can go into a room of 100 people and keep them mesmerized, and then go into another one and, keep, and talk about something else. Um, so find these folks, bring them in, make them part of your business club, but also use them as ways to extend your reach in other schools and other places where they might have interest. Tom tells me he only knows about 15 or 20 percent of the Bloomberg terminal, which kind of shocks me. Uh, but um, sort of like the human brain, I guess we only use 10 or 15 percent of it. I don't know many people that have 100 percent uh, use of the Bloomberg terminal. I think Tom is probably one of the best that I know. Um, here's something else, too. Uh, when you're first starting out, sometimes a good thing to do is to start do one-hour classes. Uh, I do a class on, so that the students get a Bloomberg certificate at the end of the uh, one hour, uh, so they go through it and learn how to uh, operate the Bloomberg terminal. If you have a Bloomberg terminal, I think most universities do, uh, get at least one free. You don't, okay. 
Well, you need to find one uh, <laughs> because what you can do, the students can sit down and in a period of about six hours can work through a tutored uh, video program that they have and you just basically show them that and then answer questions and then have them attend some le extra, lecture, extra lectures and uh, I think you'll find that uh, that, that works pretty well. Um, we had only one lonely business, uh, Bloomberg Terminal at the journalism school when I came there and it was the most ignored piece of machinery in the entire school. It just sat down there by itself. Now we've got it rolling but I needed more than one. And so I started hunting around the school and found that we have something like a hundred of them in the business school on the lower level and that they require all their students to be Bloomberg certified. So I, had, so I did a little searching and detective work and so a lot of my students now go to the business school to get their certification and the business school allows us to do that. So you might have them in a place you might not think they might be. Um, I always like to do field trips. This is last year. We went up to Omaha. I got to see Warren Buffett and some of these other lesser known people. And um, anyway, uh, it, was, it was fun. But they also got quite an education on what Warren Buffett does, who he is, met a lot of great journalists who were up there. And we got to hear from the sage for about seven hours or so uh, with uh, uh, Charlie Munger, who it was fun. Uh, here's a guy in his mid-80s, Charlie's in his early 90s, and uh, they're just amazing. Students loved it. It was easy, fairly inexpensive to do. Had to rent a, a van to get us up there, one overnight. Unfortunately, you have to be up at about 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. to get into this thing. Uh, because people line up like he's a rock star at the downtown arena. So, um, but it makes for a fun day. First day of class, I uh, always talk about summer job possibilities and uh, invite others to come to the session. And, it's, and I have a pretty good uh, set situation as far as knowing where a lot of the good business journals and summer jobs are going to be. And we talk about that, what it takes to get a job, and I make this the first order of business, um, clean up their social media accounts, all those other kinds of things that they need to do. Um, so, because one of my goals in my classes is to get as many students as possible summer jobs, because I think that that is really key to their development. So, um, if you can be rep have a reputation of someone who helps get uh, summer jobs, then that is good and that will help you. You're hired is the big thing. Uh, that students like to hear and so do parents and so I like to talk to the students about those that have. This is a student of mine, Lauren Langell. She won the race last year uh, at the uh, Supreme Court when the Obamacare ruling came down and that's her there running. Uh, she, they always have this race uh, for the most important ruling of the, uh, uh, of the year and it, she made the New York Times with this, with this uh, and so I said, Lauren, how did you find out, how did you know that the Obamacare ruling was coming down that day? And she says, I didn't. I said, well, how did you get prepared for it? And this was her secret. She memorized all of the court ruling numbers. And so she knew all of them. And she, every day she wore her track shoes. And she came dressed and ready to, ready to roll. Uh, and the goal here, they don't allow the press up there, they allow, but they allow the interns up there to get these things. And they race down, and she raced down to CNBC. And they were first with the news uh, that morning. And Lauren, lo and behold, ends up now she's working for CNBC. Um, they admired all the little things that she did during that, that summer, including this. Uh, and understanding how to be prepared, how to be first. Francesco Marconi, he walked into one of my classes. Uh, he's a business student, kind of lost, uh, had thought I was teaching something else. And uh, he ended up uh, becoming one of my better students and switched over to journalism. And now he's the number two strategist at the AP and got his MBA. Here are some students from South Africa last year. Uh, student on the right is starting for Bloomberg. Uh, Tatiana Dari, uh, Jake Kleinberg there in the middle, 
uh, took a job as uh, he's a, he's in marketing. He's a marketing manager for the Associated Press. Luke is still in school, and Elizabeth over here is going to uh, be a media law professor. So, um, you know, talk being able to talk about your students, showing some success is a good thing. Um, make sure as far as when you. Uh, uh, you put together your lesson plans and everything, that you're well organized and you have your goals and you're going to accomplish what you say you're going to accomplish. That gets out pretty quickly if you don't get that accomplished. And uh, lastly, have fun with the students. I think that's a key thing to do and have as much fun as you, as you possibly can uh, <laughs> as, you, as you move on. Um, I'd be happy to I think I've got uh, a couple of minutes if there's any questions on anything. Yeah. We're not Mizzou. Yeah. I maybe have as many majors as you have in some of those classes. Mm -hmm. So I need to know how to scale these ideas way down. So how would you, what? I, I could, I'll talk to that. Sure. <laughs> I ahead. mean, in, in the next she, session, yeah. Okay, she's going to talk about that. Where, okay. where are you? Weber State University. And, and, you know, we're part, as a, several of us, we've all kind of shared notes, several of us are in larger communication departments, and we're the journal, we are the journalist in the department, although I'm not sole anymore, but, um, but yeah, for, for not journalism schools, if right. we're going to do a business writing class, mm -hmm. I, I'm afraid I would draw one or two students. So I'm taking a different approach. Mm -hmm. well, you know, we've had many, uh, we've been doing this for nine years now. And those who are involved either are starting a program or are starting a course or having it a part of other courses they teach. Mm -hmm. if, if the student has a chance to learn something about business journalism in whatever course they're taking, and you include a segment explaining it, it's really significant when they go for a job that they have that sort of chops. So everything, it's based on scale, but, uh, but there's an opportunity to do it anywhere. And when I go overseas, often the, uh, it is a, a series of lectures or it's something else uh, that, in, that encourages them to be in business journalism. But I also think whatever uh, courses in journalism you're teaching, the fact that money runs through it and it gives much more gravitas to any story that you do. So I think everything is kind of relative. And it wasn't like when you came in the door, they said, welcome business journalism. I mean, it was, no. and the same way here, they hadn't had anything like that either. It, it, usually, everybody starts from negative point zero. <laughs> right. Like I said, I mean, I, in some ways, I really identify with you and that question. You know, I know we're at Missouri, but that doesn't mean I have tons of business journalism students. And one of the things I, you know, try to accomplish here is just some basic things that I try to do to encourage students to consider business journalism and to think about the opportunities that are there. So if you only have one or two, at least you have one or two, um, or two or three, um, because um, there it's a it's a tremendous area that's you know some of the some tremendous opportunities taking place, but it, some of it's just waking students up to the possibilities and. Um, you know, having four or five students that are interested in business journalism, I think, would be uh, at a small school, be very, very successful. And um, uh, you just have to. Um, it's a constant wake awakening thing because by the time you get them waking up, they're woken up and they've got great jobs, or and they're out of school, and you're constantly taking in the new students. So it's something you can't ever take for granted. Yeah, you cannot take it for granted. When I was overseas for. Uh, and then I come back, I realize I wasn't prime. I think this is great, we've got this number of students in this class. And then when I come back, it's like, oh, I guess I got to do that over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm okay. curious. Oh, oh I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm curious about projects or stories you've done with your students that have been significant to the community. Oh, gosh. We've, I mean, uh, we've done many of them. Um, uh, we've got. Uh, um, uh, well, first of all, we've got the elections coming up, and there's a lot of things we've done in past elections. In fact, Alicia was our first managing editor when she was a PhD student. 
who led, uh, I thought, one of our best election uh, pieces. And you talk about doing it on the shoestring. These are two interns. None of them, I mean, knew anything about business news. And we're sitting there, and it was an off-season election. I don't know what it was. And I'm like, well, we ought to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, Bill, talk amongst yourselves for a little while. And then they ended up coming back, and it was a wonderful story, because it didn't matter who won. It just followed the money. It just showed who are the biggest corporate donors. And we saw names on there we've never heard of. And, I mean, Columbia, Missouri isn't exactly Mecca for Lincoln. So mm -hmm. it was pretty interesting. We did it in about a day and a half and had somebody doing graphics. And the beautiful thing was, seriously, there were two interns, myself, and then we had um, somebody who was working in marketing, and she helped us with some of the design work and just slapped that baby together. And it, it got, it stayed up on the website a long time as far as mm -hmm. most viewed. Well, we're working on a story like that right now. Uh, Missouri is one of five states that uh, your driver's license won't work for you when you get on the airplane. Uh, TSA is getting very serious about this. And, um, uh, you know, why did this happen and how could this get changed? Uh, but, uh, so that's one. Uh, just telling people that that news was news was, was news. Um, so, you know, there's so much going on uh, constantly. Um, we also, uh, is a, we're a state that's very lax on enforcement of uh, just about everything. So um, you don't have to get your car inspected for five years, for example. So we're doing story on that. Um, so uh, that means that uh, you could probably go 150,000 miles on your car not replace your tires or your timing belt or anything else and be wailing down one of Missouri's sideways before it's ever seen an inspection. That should be Georgia doesn't inspect cars at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to have a five-year. <laughs> I'm going to fly in there and fly out of there. <laughs> Christina, I've just realized yeah. Arizona's very progressive. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Yeah. The first time ever. <laughs> so, Randy, I was curious about your uh, prerequisites. You were talking about bringing STRATCOM students and business students. Uh, when we teach a business journalism course, it's an upper level writing class, and I can't take in those students because they don't have the prerequisites. How do you handle that in Missouri? Uh, sometimes if I find students who I think will fit into the program and are smart and doing well, uh, we have uh, certain students that are in uh, Walter Williams Scholars, and things that students that have stu scored particularly high uh, when they admitted, uh, were admitted in, and they've also been doing good work on the Man Eater and other places, uh, I'll talk to the associate dean and see if I can get that waived. And so that's what I do, is I kind of work behind the scenes. The I always have about two, stu two or three students like that every year. The students who can have double majors in journalism and business are the first ones hired. Mm -hmm. They just are. They're, they're just the golden children. Mm -hmm. you know, and because people just figure all the bases are covered. And, uh, that's, that's a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, every, sto every beat needs uh, business. I mean, if you're on City Hall, you've got to know how to cover a budget. Um, if you're covering transportation, um, if you're covering county, whatever you're doing, uh, you've got to understand how to report the numbers. Yeah. My name is uh, Maru Weyukwami from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You've been a teacher for business journalism for a very long time. And uh, I want to believe that uh, there are a lot of projects that you might have conducted together with some of your past students and current students. Yes. Uh, Nigeria happens to be a country where, I mean, located in Africa, and some of the schools doesn't even know anything about business journalism, much at the colleges and universities. Not too long, 2014, there was a kind of a curriculum realignment, updating, and the likes. Mm -hmm. And uh, these regulatory bodies now said there should be a course being named business and industrial journalism. And this business and industrial journalism, you see, you can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. You have to teach. And if you now have this kind of uh, course, who is to teach it, then that means you must have a kind of knowledge or a kind of uh, education in that area. As a teacher of journalism, how do you think people like us 
student will fall in love with these new groundbreaking areas mm -hmm. in business journalism and will be very, very interesting to students. Students student will be interested in learning more about it. There are a lot of untapped stories on business outside and there. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can teach business journalism effectively? You know? Well, I mean, one of the good things uh, is the, right here at the Reynolds Business Journalism Center, they have tons of free training available. So you can get your students to tune into that uh, and to do that. Um, same with uh, investigative reporters and editors. There's things there that can be done uh, for a very small fee. Um, there are, are uh, other, other places to go for free training. Uh, Pointer Institute has things. So I think that one, that's one thing to do when you're looking for them afar, uh, to educate yourself as much as you possibly can. And then also to uh, 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 encourage students to take a business class or two and understanding, for example, what is the bottom line, you know, some basic things like that. Uh, when I taught business journalism in Nairobi a few years ago, one of the things I discovered at Nation Media, which is their largest uh, media company, was is that they didn't, the business department, which was 50 people strong, didn't really truly understand what the business, uh, the bottom line was. So uh, companies were getting away with all kinds of stuff because they were reporting the wrong number every day. Uh, this was the, you know, they were, they were and, and so uh, learning some critical things like that and making some changes uh, can have a dramatic impact on, on how business is covered. And looking for emerging industries and things of that nature, I think, is, uh, is another w area that can be a lot of fun as far as, as, far as uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Kenyon used to think that it didn't have uh, emerging industries. It's packed full of them. Um, and uh, so it's just a matter of taking a look. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's also basic reporting, realizing that one source is not gospel, and talking about the importance of multiple sourcing. And not understanding what business journalism is is something faced by almost anybody who starts it in any school. Right. Because they don't have a sense of what it is, and you have to find some things relevant to them that are interesting. You know, uh, around the world, everybody's interested in technology and types of phones and different things, and they know a lot more than you think but because they're in a different sphere. They're also used to the concept of companies coming and going and ideas coming and going. Whereas when we were coming up originally, things were pretty much there for a long time. So in emerging markets, in some ways, you don't have to go through a lot of the other stuff that clogs it all up. And, and I found that African students, just like other students, really get the idea of having to make money. And in emerging markets, what you do is so important for people to understand it. If you relate it to sports and entertainment too, the, the lights just go off in the room because they all think they want to go work for People Magazine or PETV. And you say, well, what's the biggest story? You know, you have a big playoff coming to town here. It's follow the money. And um, as far as building on something you said, I <coughs> reporters and editors, you can join for next to nothing and you have access to their database and they have tip sheets that they put together and they have people uh, every Pulitzer Prize winner I believe who's done some sort of investigative report writes an article for the IRA journal and literally how I did the story but the tip sheets on you know um, nursing home abuse I switched you over every oh, topic thanks. that's going to come up in every zip code um, it's it's a phenomenal resource you know, I was thinking. Every issue, Volkswagen, a bunch of liars. Even a diet Chipotle. I mean, whatever. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to happen. Well, let's look what happened to their stock. Oh, exactly. not so good. Yeah. You know, and uh, how could they lie like that? You know, it's like Enron. It, it, Volkswagen even lies. You know, and they're they have such great engineers that they know how to cheat engineering. You know, so all of this. Is the relevant. the other thing I was going to recommend <laughs> is the. Um, is it the Shorenstein Center at Harvard has, mm. what do they call that? Um, really good uh, sort of lesson plans on topics um, about journalism in general, but they have several about reporting on the economy and reporting on business in particular. They also send out a, an email, it seems like it's every other week, and they tap into academic research, which is just dreadful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but translated for journalists, yeah. and it's just phenomenal. They have a how to cover this and how to yeah. cover that. Yeah. And
I use those. I put those in there. Also, keep reading. I mean, I read, and I, I'm not sound, trying to sound like a crazy bookworm, but I read six or seven books every semester uh, that I'm doing, and I talk about them in class all the time and try to relate, relate them to the, uh, to the lesson. This is the one I'm reading right now. Jane Bryant Quinn just came out with this. This is a retirement thing. Yeah. Not because I'm thinking about retirement, just because she just happened to write it. And it's a very important area of money right now. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so mm. I'm going to kind of build on what Randy said. I agree with almost everything he said, mm -hmm. uh, but from a little different perspective. And I hope I will not um, overlap too much on the session that comes next. Um, just to, um, where was the speaker from Weber? She just, well, I was going to tell her. <laughs> I teach at Washington and Lee University in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Um, we have uh, fewer students in our entire university than Syracuse has in its Newhouse School, and probably fewer than Missouri has in its um, journalism school. We have about 1,800 undergrad students. So, yeah, so that's the entire university. So our department is quite small, and our community is quite small. We have 6,000 people in Lexington. Now the county has like 22,000. So um, if I can teach business journalism at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, you can teach it anywhere. <laughs> so it, uh, you sometimes you can't do all the things that you can do at a big university or in a big city. Um, but uh, there, there are ways around that. So. Um, Assuming uh, you have built it and they have come, now you have to figure out how are you going to organize your course or your courses, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So, um, this is, <laughs> uh, hmm, something's a little weird. That's not quite what's on, what's on my printout. But anyway, what, we're going to cover a couple of things. Um, those are some of them. But there are some other ones. Is there another PowerPoint or something? Uh, I don't know. Something fell off the slide, but that's OK. Um, and what I'm assuming uh, about. She's back here. You can tell her how small your school is again. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. I was, I was just going to. Yes, I, was, I, I teach at a very small college, uh, 1,800 students, so, okay. Um, so uh, what I'm assuming when I, when I talk to you about teaching business journalism is that what you're teaching is a specialty course and it, that it's aimed at journalism students and that the students have little or no business background. That may not be true in, in all of your cases. So. Um, we can talk about exceptions if that's. Um, so the first thing you have to decide when you're starting to teach business journalism is, I guess, is it going to be a full course? Uh, some of you might want to make it a segment in another reporting course. I've actually, we have a course that um, focuses on teaching students uh, the political system of state and local government because our politics department doesn't do anything below the national level. <laughs> and so we find that our students aren't getting this basic understanding of how state governments and city governments work, and they need to have that. So we actually teach that course. And we've thought about adding some modules to that that have to do with how the business world works and how the legal system works. Um, so that would be a possibility, too. Um, I have found when I went to Washington Lee that it worked well to have two different courses one that focuses on um, business and one on economics and the financial markets. Um, our courses are just 12 weeks long. So if you have like a 15 or 16 week course, it'll probably work just fine to do it all in, in one uh, term. What, what you need to figure out is how much interest is there in your topic and whether you can attract um, 15 or 16 students to two classes, or whether just getting that many into one class would be, um, would be a good accomplishment. 
So, and that's something you'd need to talk to your, your dean or your department head about as well. Um, and uh, we actually do require all of our journalism majors to take one specialty reporting course. And this has been a way to get uh, some general journalism majors into the business journalism courses. They have some other options. They can take science reporting or legal reporting, but business or economics reporting is one that fulfills that as well. So you get some kids who are business journalism majors, and then you get some kids who are just journalism majors. And then you also have the STRATCOM majors, um, whom I welcome in my class, and you do have the business majors or the econ majors, and we can talk about that um, in a little bit as well. Uh, one thing I'd, I want to emphasize is that when you're in an, an academic environment, you're involved in education, not training. Uh, and there's a little bit of difference there. These are not people like the ones in the other room who have already decided that they are journalists and they are business journalism. These are kids who are still searching. And uh, one of the things that I had to come to terms with when I first started teaching business journalism, or started teaching, is um, when a student decides not to become a business journalist or not to become a journalist, that I don't take that as a personal failure. It is their life. <laughs> and um, I mean, I actually, it, it did pain me the first couple years when like my favorite students, you know, someone I would have just packed up in a suitcase and taken to one of my old newsrooms, you know, uh, one of them became an insurance adjuster um, with Progressive. Because, well, it turns out she, um, um, she had a real need for job security. She came from a you know, a um, home situation where she had a lot of debts and she just needed to support herself and she needed, she went to one of those job fairs and Progressive loves liberal arts graduates and they hired her and she actually had a great job with them. Uh, and she did tell me later that she was putting all of her journalistic training to work as she was trying to find out the truth in an insurance claim. So that made me feel good. But um, now that I'm a little more comfortable with the fact that some of my students will not become business journalists or even journalists. Um, I, I try to think about what am I teaching in class that will stay with them? What are the life lessons? So you're trying to do two things. You're trying to prepare them for the internship at Bloomberg, but also prepare them to be good citizens and lifelong learners. And I think if you keep that in mind, that will, um, that will keep you going and maybe um, uh, keep some of the students going too. <clears throat> so when you when you start thinking about how to structure a course, um, I consider certain topics just sacrosanct in business or economic reporting. Um, financial statements, I think, are uh, they are one of those life lessons that kids will find useful uh, regardless. Of, of what profession they go into. I actually find when I have business, journal business majors in my courses, and I kind of assume they already know how to read financial statements, and they've had accounting and everything, that sometimes just going it over it again from a journalist's perspective is helpful. And they actually either learn a little better or learn new things. Um, I think the notion of regulation is important to include in one or both of your classes. Um, I love to talk about economic indicators. And I find students who have taken economics classes never learn about economic indicators. So those are actually, I think, kind of fun to, to teach and to uh, include in a class. Uh, the Federal Reserve, I think, is essential for students to, um, to learn about. There's actually some uh, really good books that have just come out about the Federal Reserve. They're pretty long and dense, so I'm not sure I'm going to include them yet, but um, the Federal Reserve is actually a pretty uh, open organization and has uh, as part of its mission to um, educate the public, including students. So if you call, yeah. call and ask them for help or a speaker, they're usually pretty receptive. Um, I think it's essential to include a segment about nonprofits in your course. Uh, as Randy said, it's a source of great information. 
And it's one of those areas that falls through the cracks, so they're not teaching it in the other basic journalism courses. It's a huge part of our economy, so I think it fits really well there. And you can have a lot of fun uh, teaching nonprofits. I always like to uh, point out to my students that um, sororities and fraternities are nonprofit organizations, so they get to look up the 990s for their own chapters and the nationals, and that's kind of fun. Uh, not to mention universities. So. And then uh, the stock market, uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, I think helping the students just understand uh, the basic information about how the markets work are also essentials. Um, I've listed a, uh, some story types that I think are, um, they're just sort of basic financial journalism stories that I think it's important for students to know how to approach should they be in an internship somewhere. Um, IPOs, just what do you do if a company is going public? Um, the way I teach it is through a hypothetical. Uh, so I just pick a company that has recently gone public and I hold a press conference and they have to ask me for questions about it. And then they have to write on deadline an IPO story. And it's, it's a lot of fun. This year, what did we do this year? I think, oh, we did um, Shake Shack. I try to pick a company that they kind of know about. <laughs> um, one time we did GoPro, um, and so they sort of get into it, and, and that's, that's fun. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, a big um, area, and again, just the basics of how do you approach a story, what do you have to include if you're doing mergers and acquisitions. Earnings, you know, the bane of all of our existence. Maybe we won't have to teach it anymore since the Associated Press has now automated earnings, <laughs> which is, <coughs> but I still feel that students need to ha know how to look at a press release or financial statements and figure out um, where the news is. Um, how to do a stock market story, again, that's automated too, but it, it helps them really understand what's going on with the stock market. And then a basic company profile. How do you write a responsible, well-sourced story about a company, a public company, uh, or a private company? And um, those are some of the basics that I include. Then there's all sorts of other things that you can throw in. I was thinking I shouldn't have called this optional topics, because actually some of them I think are pretty important too. Um, I always do uh, a segment on retailing. Um, Everybody kind of understands it intuitively. Uh, we usually do it around Thanksgiving, so it's kind of a local Christmas shopping outlook story. Um, but it helps to um, introduce them to new sources of information and data so that it's not just a puff piece. Uh, real estate, again, pretty easy to do on a local level. Banking, I struggle with teaching banking. <laughs> it's, I, I feel I have to do it, but I should get better about that. Uh, globalization, I think, is an important element to include in your um, courses. I was telling some folks last night, um, the way I've introduced this topic in the past is by asking all the students to go to their closets and look at six items of clothing and the, um, the little tags in the back and then come and report where those items were made. And uh, this year, we're going to um, add a new level to that. They're going to do a, it's, uh, a map. So each student will like post on this map where those item, what those items are and where they were made. And it just kind of visually um, hits them in the head, oh, the garment industry is globalized. And then I also asked them to wear to class that day something that was made in the United States, which is a challenge. So, <laughs> um, but then you can find, the, what I try to convey is that globalization is happening everywhere and that you can find evidence of it in every community, even Lexington, Virginia. This year I'm going to be doing something on politics and business. Um, how can you not? Uh, so we'll be looking at the economic um, platforms of the candidates. And um, I often include something about business media because I tend to um, require students to read the Wall Street Journal and I want them to know that there's lots of other sources of business information so I have each one pick a different business source, become knowledgeable about it, and then do an oral report 
about it. And uh, instead of doing PowerPoints, what I do now is I have them do a handout. And it's just um, something I've, I've um, started to do in some classes that I really enjoy. Is It's a way of helping them think visually about how to present information. Uh, I also find if students do PowerPoints, kind of like us, they go on and on forever. So, <laughs> so if they just pass out um, um, little flyers that summarize the information, it's, it's uh, pretty good. I like to include something in my classes about um, uh, labor and work life and the little people. And I like to remind people that uh, business and economic journalism is not just about the people at the top, but it should also be about the people at the bottom. And there's some really good stories to be done there. I find that um, I think it's a shortcoming of the profession that we don't cover labor and workplace issues very well anymore. I think it coincides to a certain extent with the decline of unions. It's hard to cover workers when there's not an organized workforce because they've all been told not to talk to the press. But I try to um, find ways to connect our students with that perspective on the business world. And then consumers. Um, I think it's also um, fun if you're able to, to do a consumer-oriented story. Consumer journalism has kind of gone the way of labor journalism, I think, that people don't do it as much as they used to, but you can do some really um, fun comparison stories about cell phone plans or pizza delivery or things like that and engage the students in um, sort of how do you carefully construct a consumer story and how important it is to have everything pinned down. So just some, some other topics you can put in there. Oh, and one other I forgot to put on this list is uh, bankruptcy. It's um, kind of the, it follows um, nicely from the, the segment you're doing on financial statements and earnings. So what happens if you don't earn money for a long period of time unless you're Amazon? Um, <laughs> and, and bankruptcy is actually, um, as we know, there's some, some really good stories to be done there um, about Chapter 11 in particular and then strategic bankruptcy, a la Donald Trump. <laughs> Um, I'm, I think the next speakers are going to go into this more, correct? Uh, picking a text and things like that, so I'll just sort of... Um, you can never have too much. Never have too much. <laughs> um, uh, I do use Chris Rausch's book, Show Me the Money, for uh, a main textbook. I cover about half of it in one course and half in the other. Um, I sometimes use uh, the New York Times um, reader on business and economics that Mark Papke is, did he speak Tachi. here? Hmm? Tachi. Tachi, sorry. Um, uh, it's done. He's got some nice sort of annotated New York Times business stories and what the students like is it, he's got little things to see what this, you know, see what this person is doing with this story here and this is how you do this. Um, this winter when I teach reporting on the economy I'll use Greg Ipp's Little Book of Economics which I think is um, fabulous. Um, Greg is back at the Wall Street Journal. He um, had been with The Economist, um, but he's, he's really wonderful. Yeah. Have you used that with the students here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it works. I mean, because I, I got it from you know, a random teacher. And I, I thought the beginning sort of assumes some understanding that I didn't think. I mean, you know, when you start talking about things that happened like 30 years ago, I mean, and, and he just, so, but did it work for them? Mm -hmm, did they get mm -hmm, it? Yeah. I, I think I don't use every chapter, but um, I think he's really good on, uh, I think the Rausch book isn't as good on economics. Yeah. Um, and so I think the IP book really complements that pretty well. I, I've liked it. Do you think Chris's book is getting a little long in the tooth now in terms of his <laughs> examples and stuff? I mean, you know, in journalism texts um, are instantly outdated. Uh, so it's not just Chris's. I mean. You know, if you teach journalism 101, uh, you know the book you, that arrived in the mail today is out of date. So, yeah. And some so, of it is based on the traditional business section in a paper in some It doesn't exist so anymore. Doesn't right. Exist. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. it's, it's not bad information, but some of it is the things that they are less likely to be dealing with. Absolutely, yeah. But there are some good sort of basics in there, too. But, um, but 
you know, textbooks are expensive, so I think it's possible. This is expensive. It's very expensive. That was it's the game breaker expensive. with that very one. Very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's possible to teach um, this course without any text, um, but I haven't done that yet. Um, I. I'll have them buy the older edition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll just say buy the earlier edition. Yeah. I also I put them on reserve and I say, look, you know, I'm only going to use five chapters in this book. Read it here. You know, you don't have to buy it. Um, I try to include every term a, a book about business or the economy written by a journalist. Um, so um, this past this fall, I used. The Everything Store by Brad Stone, which is about Amazon, and, and the students loved it. This is the second year I've used that. And then um, Ashley Vance, who's also with Bloomberg, came out with a book about Elon Musk, which I thought, oh, the kids are going to really love that too. So I've done something I've never done before. I gave them a choice. So half the class read uh, The Everything Store and half read <laughs> Elon Musk. It was a little weird, but it um, I think it kind of worked. And then. We Skyped simultaneously with Brad Stone and Ashley Vance, who are both in San Francisco. And we did the split screen thing. And actually, it was great. Uh, it, it, and you, know, you sort of prepped the students so that they're asking the questions. And, um, and I didn't know Brad or Ashley. I don't know them. So I think it's good to work connections. But don't rule out the cold call. You'd be surprised <laughs> how, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, how gracious um, journalists are when you ask them to either come visit or Skype with your class, especially if you're buying their book. Um, I've used some Michael Lewis books. I'm um, uh, uh, not necessarily, um, I've, I haven't used uh, Boomerang in a couple years. Um, last year I used a book by Beth Macy called Factory Man. It's a really wonderful way to talk about globalization. She happens to be from Roanoke, Virginia, and it's about the collapse of the furniture industry, which um, um, was huge in Virginia and North Carolina. And it was a New York Times bestseller. And then I had her come speak, so that was really good. But there's, I mean, every, every month, I think, there are books coming out that are um, narrative ways to introduce students to journalism that really help complement a textbook, which can be pretty dry. Um, and I like to teach with movies, too. So um, I've used the social network to teach um, sort of uh, business strategy and have students sort of watch key decision points in that company's growth. I know it's not completely factual, but it's a good movie. Um, Too Big to Fail was a great HBO movie, I think, that I will be using uh, this winter. Uh, but I'll also give students a choice. If they can see the big short, um, I'll use either that or Too Big to Fail. If you, um, I actually like the movie, The Big Short. Who's seen the movie, The Big Short? Yeah. I like the movie better than the book. <laughs> so, and there's some good teaching. Um, teaching. Well, they they the bit today, hmm? What's that? Andrew, I'm sorry. No, yeah. I'm just saying that they made it, a, they made it more uh, user friendly, the movie. Well, I think it's surprisingly humor, accessible. Humor. Yeah, yeah. Do you have the students watch the movies on their own time? I do. You, okay, so they don't. And I don't ask where they got it, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, how do you know they watched it? I mean, what's the exercise to yeah, force so, the activity? So usually what I do is I have them uh, uh, write an essay based on the movie, and then we devote one class time to discussing the themes from the movie, um, usually have the discussion the day that the essay is due. So and that's a graded exercise. You grade it, the essay. Absolutely, yeah. I grade everything. So <laughs> I find I don't know about maybe it's just my students, but if you don't put a grade on it, mm, is it just my students? No. No. Yeah. I didn't think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I'm organizing a class, I um, I try to have a variety of types of assignments. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I do have non-journalism majors in my class. That's one way that I make the number. Um, and so some of them are coming in never having written uh, journalistic stories. But I, I tell them I'll spend extra time with them. I'll give them a chance to rewrite them. Um, and you know, 
some of my best students have been like biology majors. <laughs> I mean, I had a biology major who her senior year just wanted to take a journalism course, signed up for reporting on the economy, I think. She had an awesome writing style. I've had history majors who are terrific, too. Business, journal business majors, maybe not so much. But, um, I mean, let's face it, journalistic writing is good writing. And um, you can teach people how to do that. Um, so, but I still, I like to have some assignments that are not journalistic assignments. So we have the essay. Um, I usually have a midterm in my classes, and I try to sort of front load the course so that there's more quantitative stuff in the first half so that, because that's easier to, to test in a midterm. I try to make sure that at least one of my assignments is not just writing, that it also involves some multimedia. And I think um, that, you know, for those of you who are succeeding me, <laughs> that should become even more important. Um, you know, they're going to be working in a multimedia world. Um, uh, but I do want writing and reporting uh, to be at least <coughs> half of the grade. Um, so um, I know the next session is about a syllabus, so I'm just going to say a few things about how I think about a syllabus. I think it's really important that you put a lot of work up front into constructing your syllabus. To me, it's a contract with your student. Um, uh, we're going to do this. If you do this, this will be the result. And I find every term, I am more and more explicit about <laughs> what I expect, how their grade's going to be, uh, de be determined, what's the consequence if the story comes in five minutes late. I just want to be absolutely clear up front. And I think the kids respond to that. They, what they don't like are surprises or murkiness. Um, I think in terms of uh, specific topics I want to accomplish and try to uh, break the course into blocks. So maybe a week on this, maybe two weeks on this. Sometimes there's some things that you just spend a day on, something like that, but that's fine. But you sort of think about that, and then I think there's kind of an arc to, uh, to a course, and it, it seems to me it should sort of culminate in something. And so I usually have it culminate in a, a longer, in-depth story. Um, and um, I, I do try to relate an assignment to every topic. So it's not just, well, we're talking about this, the, there's nothing I have to do as a result. It doesn't, it doesn't stick. So I try to make sure that there is some sort of assignment to each, um, to each one. Uh, I do like to have a little variety in the, the nature of the, the writing. So some are journalistic stories, but sometimes I have them write a memo. Um, Sometimes they'll do just oral presentations. Um, I will occasionally do a debate. I don't think I'm, I haven't quite mastered how to do an in-class debate, but I do think it's, um, it's fun. We, let's see, what did we debate? We debated um, capping executive compensation. Executive compensation. Um, there was something at the, S, at the SEC that was being considered about whether to cap executive compensation. And, um, and then, I didn't do this, but I was tempted to ask the kids which side of the, the question they wanted to be on and then assign them the other one. But I might do that sometime. <laughs> they, they do get very excited. What, what I did yeah. was one China versus the U.S. in the future. And yeah. I put all the Chinese on the American side yeah, and yeah. put the other yeah. ones on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then they start taunting each other. They're going back and forth. Yeah. It, it really is a lot of fun. It is fun. It's, of course, it's impossible to grade. Um, but I do, I, what I've done is I bring in uh, professors, uh, other professors from the department to help me grade it. And then I just give the winning side an A and the losing side an A minus or something like that, unless they're truly awful, but usually they're not awful. <laughs> I require every student to speak. Someone different has to do the opening than the closing. And um, we did minimum wage one time. That's, that'll get them going, at least on my <laughs> campus. Um, I already talked about midterms. Um, I've never done a final for my class, but I, um, I think you certainly could. It wouldn't, wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, Let's talk about quizzes. <laughs> How many do current events quizzes in your classes? I know, yeah. 
Do you find that? Just uh, started. Yeah. You good? Good. Yes. good. Yeah. I actually started doing reading quizzes too after one of my classes suggested it. Ah. Uh, to yeah. make for better discussions. And I was like, well, yeah. I like it for the class that came before you. Right. Um, and it's just one or two questions. And yeah. It's more grading, but it seems to work really Yeah, well. quizzes are pretty easy to grade. And they do sort of keep kids um, engaged in current events. And I, I, I've started a reading quiz in my Journalism 101 class at the request of the students because they felt it would prepare them better for the final, which I think it does. Um, yeah, Desi. I have the students write the questions and the answers, and then I go through them and present the best ones, but they're all required to turn in the questions. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, now I don't have to write the questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good. But they kind of get in competition with each other, like who can write the best. That's a good idea. And it, and it achieves the same purpose, which is to make them read the news. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, that's a good idea. And then I have them, uh, I hand each one, each person hands it to the next person, and we go over it so it reinforces the material. But I don't grade it. It's just so they can just sort of concentrate. And they take it real seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, even even in pretend situations, they don't, they don't want to be losers, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, Constructing assignments, which the next group will probably talk about a little bit. Um, I, um, I do insist that students get off of campus when they're doing reporting assignments. They, they may not just interview their roommates and their favorite econ professor and call it a story. They have to talk to people in the community. I do let them use people from the university, but they have to have others as well. I think it's really important that they, that they learn how to speak to people they don't know. Um, I mean, I actually think that's one of the life lessons that they learn from that. And I'm often surprised that the business majors are like the most terrified of cold calls. And I thought, what do you think you're going to be doing as an investment banker? You know, Nobody so. talked to me. They wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> yeah. oh, so I said, welcome to, our, <laughs> welcome to our world. Um, knock on a door. <laughs> I do have uh, deadline exercises, at least one in every class. And this was feedback I got from students who graduated and went into the profession. They said, we didn't do enough actual deadline work. And I actually find students sometimes do better on the deadline exercises than on the ones where they have an infinite amount of time. So I mentioned the IPO story. We will do, um, we'll do a deadline stock market story. And um, oh, we did a deadline retail roundup after. Um, after they did their little survey of the, um, of the local retailers. And it's just, um, it's a good thing. And I, you know, it's graded and they, they it really focuses their attention. Um, one thing that I've, I've learned the hard way is to really make clear what the assignments are. And I, it might be a generational thing. I think possibly the students we're teaching now are so distracted that they really aren't processing things that you simply say. Um, so when I have an assignment, I write it. I will post it on our class online site. I will often hand it out anyway, even though I know it wastes trees. I will tell them about it. I will write it on the board. I will tell them in many ways. And I think um, that helps improve the quality of the, um, of the assignment you'll get back, and it also minimizes debates afterwards about, you didn't tell us that. Well, as a matter of fact, I did tell you that. <laughs> you may not have heard it, but I don't know. Has, has any of you noticed that the current generation of students is like really distracted? I, when I was doing, um, I think it was the IPO story, and so it was a, pro a press conference, and they were interviewing me, and I was giving them information which I was reading from you know, my notes. And the stories that came back had like four different prices of the IPO. And I thought, wow, these kids can't listen. They can't listen. Or they don't take good notes. Or they're dyslexic or something. But that was kind of a wake up call to me. Um, grading. Um, one of my colleagues says, I teach for free, 
but they pay me to grade. Yeah, grading's really hard, I think. We love them all, but sometimes they can't all get A's. Um, and so I try to be explicit about how you'll get an A, how you'll get a B, how you get a C. Um, I think you need to be explicit about your policy on fact errors. Um, some, uh, there's the famous Medill F, and that's that's uh, throughout all of Medill if it's a, it's a misspelled name or. Actually, we found out, we discovered that not all of us do abide by that. Yeah. Factually incorrect. And um, it's we an automatic F, and the students, depending on where they are in the course, we could review it. But the highest grade they can get it is typically a C. Yeah, we we have that policy as well, but it's not um, department wide because of academic freedom. Yeah. So, um, but so you just need to be explicit. What is your policy about fact errors? If you get an F, may you rewrite it? That kind of thing. Um, I find it's really helpful to tell students, this is what I'm going to be looking for in the paper. You know, I'm going to be looking at how many sources did you interview, and you know, how compelling was your lead, and how do you use, and it's like, oh, you're actually going to count how many people I talked to. That's an idea, <laughs> you know, so. We have to segue to the next room because we have many things going on here. Yeah, I think I'm uh, almost done. See, see you trampled by a group of people. Okay. But, but she is going to be here, and she'll, you can wind up whatever. We have to get out of the room. That's, oh. The young lady didn't just come by to say hi. She was saying. Get out. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so we'll just leave it at that, and I'll be around at lunch. Mm -hmm.